highly inflammatory product. They use that experimentally. If you want to produce intense inflammation, you can inject that in an animal, and they'll have an intense inflammatory reaction. Good thing to put in foods. Broth, stock. Just, the names just go on and on and on, so you have to know the names to be able to recognize it. And you'll see foods that'll say, contains no MSG, but they'll contain three or four of these. And the law allows them to do it because the FDA law says that only if it's 99% pure MSG do they have to put it on the label. So it can be 98% MSG, and they don't even have to put it on the label. They can use one of these little names. And so you're not protected when you see it contains no MSG, or you go to the restaurant and you say, did your food contain MSG? And they say, no, but it contains hydrolyzed vegetable protein or some of these others. Uh, and sometimes they don't even know. You'd be amazed. I mean, people in restaurants have no idea that hydrolyzed vegetable protein is, is monosodium glutamate concentrate. Now, these are the foods that are especially high in excitotoxins. Anytime you use something like a gravy, uh, if you use salad dressings that are commercially prepared, particularly diet salad dressings, they're all high in glutamates. And you'd be amazed you know, when people say they go out and eat and they have a salad and they use the ranch dressing and they have this horrible headache. Or they clouded in their thinking, they can't remember. That's because of the monosodium glutamate in the salad dressing. Soups are notorious. All commercial soups use a lot of monosodium glutamate. And Campbell's soup is the worst. Uh, Campbell's, I check their labels regularly. I've seen as many as four different types of excitotoxins added to a single can of soup. And that's why they taste so good. And what happens when you're sick? Let's have some soup. What do they do in the hospital when you come back from brain surgery or you come back from other kind of surgery or you've had hypertension or diabetes problem? Well, we're going to put you on a, low, a, a diet right now of just soup all the time. This is the stepwise after surgery. You start with soup and then the soft liquid, uh, soft uh, foods and then you move up to solid food. That first stage, you're flooding them with excitotoxins and making them much worse. So soups are notorious. Any diet food, when you make diet food, you remove the fat. When you remove the fat, you remove the taste. So the manufacturers quickly say, we can take out the fat, we can put in the MSG and it replaces it and they'll eat it. So diet foods, you can just plan on it. If it's a manufactured processed food, it's going to contain a high concentration of excitotoxin. Uh, liquid amino acid preparations. Everybody asks me about amino acid preparations because of veggie ends use this a lot. I get calls from all of the United States asking about it. Anytime you break down a protein to its free amino acids, you're getting high concentrations of excitotoxin. I don't care what they say. You call the company and they say, no, we don't add excitement. No, we don't have MSG. Yes, they do. They say MSG is a salt of glutamate, monosodium glutamate. It's not the sodium that's causing the problem. It's the glutamate. So if they break down the protein and they have a high concentration of glutamate, no, it's not MSG, but it's glutamate. It's the glutamate that's the excitotoxin. In nature, the way God planned things is that proteins are to be broken down slowly in your system. Then your body utilizes it very slowly and it doesn't build up into your blood or your brain. We weren't meant to eat hydrolyzed, broken down protein and free amino acids. Our body doesn't know how to handle that. So when you consume monosodium glutamate, your blood levels can reach 20-fold higher than normal. A brain doesn't know how to handle 20-fold higher normal monosodium glutamate. Neither does the liver, the muscles, or the other organ systems. It wasn't designed that way. Now let's look, I'm just going to, I'm going to give you something that you're probably going to hate, but this is just the, the physiology of the excitotoxic process. What goes on in a nerve cell when it's exposed to excitotoxins? But this just gives you kind of an overview. <clears throat> Now first, there are a lot of diseases and disorders that are associated with excitotoxicity, and this gr list is growing every day. They're finding more and more diseases that have anything to do with the brain is associated with excitotoxicity. It seems to be a central process in a lot of different diseases.
And this is what we're finding out throughout medicine is that there's just simple, central things that are causing a wide spectrum of disease. What makes the difference between one disease and another, whether it's cancer or Alzheimer's disease or arthritis, is the excitotoxicity is producing it in different tissues. We know that head injuries, if you injure your head, what happens is we've known for some time that most of the damage that happens to your brain in the head injury doesn't happen at the time of the injury. That does happen, but usually not. It's delayed several hours. And we've gone through all kinds of contortion trying to figure out what is this delayed damage and how can we stop it? Well, now they've discovered it's excitotoxicity because when your brain is injured, it releases glutamate from itself because normally glutamate is a transmitter in the brain. It's the most common transmitter in the brain. But it's carefully, carefully regulated. When you injure your brain, it can't regulate it anymore, and it builds up a high level in your brain and produces the delayed injury that frequently results in severe neurological injury or death. Strokes. When you have a stroke and a block off a blood vessel is going to the brain, it is the lack of blood supply that causes the worst part of the stroke. That just kills a little tiny core of brain tissue. Around that tiny core, the brain starts secreting enormously large amounts of excitotoxin. And that's what causes the devastating aspect of a stroke. If we block those excitotoxins, the stroke is much, much less. And you can do that with something that God created called food. Hypoglycemic brain damage. When your blood sugar falls extremely low and people go into a coma or die, it's not because the brain cells are starved for glucose. It's because when they're starved for glucose, they release a lot of glutamate, and the glutamate kills the brain cell. Uh, AIDS dementia has recently been shown to be caused by uh, excitotoxicity. Migraine headaches are caused by it. Anytime your nervous system is infected with a virus or a bacteria, it causes the brain to secrete large amounts of glutamate, and that's what does the damage. Seizures are caused by glutamate excess, cytotoxicity. Most of your seizure drugs, anti-seizure drugs, block glutamate. Uh, all of these different things, degenerative brain disease, Parkinson's, ALS, Alzheimer's disease, the hottest area of research is the death of the brain cells by glutamate. It can cause immune suppression, episodic violence, and learning disorders. Now, if you look at a typical brain cell, you have the cell body, or the main part of the cell, and you have this long process called an axon, and at this end looks like a, a spiny tree in the winter. This is the dendrite. This is where all the different connections are made in the brain. They connect each other, and dotted on here, you see these little squares here? That's the receptors. That's where glutamate attaches to send the signals down the nerve cell. So glutamate is normal in the brain. It's the most common transmitter, as I said, and its function is to carry information from one brain cell to the next so your brain will work. And it carries out almost everything that you can think of in your brain is somehow connected to glutamate neurotransmitter. Now this is the neurodegenerative process, and basically this is what is the central process for all those diseases I listed about excitotoxicity. That whole long list. This is what happens. And this is similar to what happens in cancer, surprisingly, and arthritis. We're finding that everything is a central mechanism. But in the brain, there's one little difference, and that has to do with this membrane here. It has a little pore in it, a little opening, a channel. This is microscopic. You can only see that on an electron microscope. And what this does is this little pore opens and closes. And glutamate controls the opening and closing of that little pore. Normally, there's very little glutamate outside of that brain cell. I mean, absolutely minute amounts in millionths of a mole, okay? And it has to be that way because if that level rises, it'll kill that brain cell. So your brain goes to a lot of trouble to make sure that glutamate level outside that nerve cell never gets above that 10 to 12 millionths of a mole. And it does that by a process where anytime glutamate's out there, it combines with a special transport protein, and that whisks it away and puts it in a cell called an astrocyte and stores it there until it's needed. Only when you're going to have a transmission of an impulse will it release it. And when it does, it breaks loose of the transport protein, attaches to its receptor, opens up the hole, 
and calcium pours into your cell. And then it whisked away again and the hole closes. So it's only open for a millionth of a second, just enough to let a few molecules of calcium in. Once that calcium is in, it starts triggering these processes. And these processes normally, if it's just a little bit of calcium, what it does, it makes the nerve fire its impulse. If something happens and there's too much glutamate, it opens that hole up for too long, too much calcium gets in. If too much calcium gets in, then too, uh, too intense of a reaction of these uh, different processes take place, and it'll produce an inflammatory reaction in that cell with these inflammatory chemicals. It'll produce what we call free radicals, which are just very toxic chemicals that bounce around the cell, oxidizing all the components of the cell. One of the components that really damages is what we call the mitochondria, and that's the little part of your cell that produces almost all the energy that you use for everything, whether it's walking, moving, thinking. Mitochondria supplies the energy for everything. Uh, these free radicals generated by too much calcium damages that mitochondria, so it can no longer produce its energy the way it's supposed to. If it can't produce enough energy, the cell dies. It activates a gene called a P53 gene, which is the suicide gene in your cell. Cells are pretty smart. God made them that way. If this cell is damaged too bad by all these processes and the cell knows that it cannot survive, it'll activate that gene and go ahead and kill itself. We call that apoptosis. And that's what too much calcium coming in will do. We also know that if some of these products build up, they'll inhibit this transport protein so that more glutamate will start building up. So it's a kind of a cyclic process that just keeps going until the cell dies. Now, note with the knowledge that if too much glutamate out here is toxic, and it doesn't take a lot to, to make it toxic, does it make a lot of sense to add it to your food? Knowing that it trans, uh, goes through, the transfers through the blood-brain barrier and will enter the brain, which we have proof of, Now, when we look at excitotoxin sensitivity, three things we see that are very important. One is that human is five times more sensitive than the next most sensitive life form on Earth, the mouse. And we're really 20 times more sensitive than a rhesus monkey. Newborn babies are four times more sensitive than adults. So if you're pregnant and you're eating food that contains a lot of MSG, that is passed through the placenta into the baby and damages the baby's brain at a time that brain is being formed. And they're four times more sensitive than an adult would be. Why are the babies so sensitive to MSG? It's because their brain enzymes that normally protect them are immature. They haven't formed yet. Their blood-brain barrier is immature. It hasn't completely formed yet. And babies and toddlers frequently become hypoglycemic, which magnifies excitotoxicity. Now, what are these 